Okay. Welcome to the closed session portion of tonight's City Council meeting of September 20th, 2021. I am calling this meeting to order. The time now is 6 p.m. Madam Clerk, may we have a roll call, please? Council Member Hernandez? Sorry about that. Present. Member Martinez? Present. Member Mer or Press? Present. Mayor Pro Tem Rollins? Here. And Mayor Gama? Here. Mr. City Attorney, could you please read the cl closed session item into the record? Absolutely, Mayor Gama. We have one closed session item tonight. It's conference with labor negotiators pursuant to government code section 54957.6. The agency designated representatives are Brad Connors, city manager, Charles Parrott's deputy city manager, and myself, city attorney. Uh, the employee association that is bargaining is SEIU Service Employees International Union Local 721. Thank you. Do any council members have any conflicts to disclose for the listed closed session agenda item? Hearing none, we will now recess the closed session. The time now is 6.02 p.m.
Okay. Just waiting for them to finish. Yeah. All righty. Okay. The time now is 6.35. Welcome to the City Council regular meeting. If you all could please join me in the flag salute. Right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. So welcome to the regular city council meeting of September 20th, 2021, and the special meeting of the Surplus Property Authority and Port Wainimi Housing Authority. This meeting has been called to order. Ms. Clerk, can you please take a roll call? Councilmember Hernandez? Present. Councilmember Martinez? Present. Councilmember Perez? Present. Mayor Pro Tem Rollins? Here. And Mayor Gama? Here. Mr. Deputy City Attorney, can you please provide a closed session report? Of course. Thank you, Mayor Gama. Uh, in accordance with Government Code Section 54957.1, any reportable actions will take place during items 13 and 14 tonight when final decision is reached on agreements. Okay, thank you. Um, tonight's inspiration is provided by yours truly. Um, and so uh, I'm going to get started on that right away. My inspiration is dedicated to all who struggle with life's challenges. September as a month is dedicated to suicide awareness, suicide prevention awareness, I should say, prostate cancer prevention, disaster preparedness. And on top of these, September is also, as you know, remembrance of 9-11. Inspiration or being inspired is the best medicine to confront the problems of life. In most cases, attitude plays a huge part of a person's ability to overcome challenges. Being down and out helps nobody. Being up and engaged with a positive attitude is the better way. In life, we all experience sadness, diagnoses, mini disasters, major disasters, and maybe even depression of, or overindulgent. But as we all know, life goes on. On January 17, 1963, the Port Wainimi City Council approved the Wainimi Bay development. This came on the heels of the construction of the community center on Park Avenue, which started in August of 1962. In order for Wainimi Bay to happen, it was necessary to annex the property into the city and change the name of Oxnard Road to Channel Islands Boulevard. Construction began on Wainimi Bay in February 1963. Amazingly, the first six sections were completed by October 1964. One of the innovations was becoming one of the first communities in the area without overhead electrical lines. Wainimi Bay was first designed to be for residents 39 years of age or older. I guess that was considered old back then. <laughs> now I believe it's 55 and older. In August 1963, the $21 million Residential Recreation Coastal Community was awarded the Top Home Buyers Rating by a national magazine. It was reported that over 5,000 people came through to take a look at this new innovative concept to housing. When completed, it was marked as an elegant 120-acre development with all the recreational amenities necessary for coastal living. Recreation was a big part of the plan for Wainimi Bay. A tennis and swim club was planned and also a par three golf course. The HOA took on the name the Carefree Living Association. After construction of the first sections, financial difficulties arose and threatened the rest of the development. 
So 141 residents of the new Wainimi Bay came together and formed a corporation to raise the needed money to complete the development. Plans were scaled back and eventually the project was completed and it still stands today. What I find inspiring about Wainimi Bay is the fact that it has stood the test of time. I spent a lot of time in and around Wainimi Bay with my other job and I find the residents to be extremely happy. When you walk the grounds, you see it's very well maintained at Wainimi Bay. More than anywhere else in our community, you see the power of smiles. You see the power of embracing life's challenges with enthusiasm. From the senior exercise classes to the water aerobics, and of course, the little golf course, you see residents enjoying life. When you realize this HOA has been in existence for 58 years and goes by the name Carefree Living Association, it's no wonder. So to close out my inspiration, I want to share with you all, I wanted to share with you all some inspiration quotes, which I believe are alive and well at Wainimi Bay. Only in sorrow can bad weather master us. When we are joyful, we face a storm and defy it. You yourself, as much as anyone else in the entire universe, deserve your love and affection. Each day begins with a huge act of courage for all of us. It's called getting out of bed. Not until we are lost do we begin to understand ourselves your mission on earth is not finished if you are alive. Out of suffering have merged the strongest souls, the most massive characters are with the scars to prove it. Hope is stronger than fear. A pessimist, a pessimist sees the difficulties in everything while an optimist sees the opportunities in every difficulty. Life is short, forgive quickly, kiss very slowly, love truly and smile frequently. We elected officials have to be inspirational, especially in times of loss. We all have been reminded recently how delicate and short life is. So tonight is a night to be inspired by those who have left us. Let's work for better while enjoying the time all of us get to spend together. Let's hope that we do things that pass the test of time like Wainimi Bay. And that concludes my inspiration. Thank you. We are now moving on to... General public comments. I believe I have two. And we'll go with George Shoup. George? Oh, that's for housing. Was it general public comments pertaining just to housing? Okay, so we'll do that under general public comments for housing. Okay, we're, when are we going to call housing to order? We'll do that here right after uh, general public comments. Okay. Okay, so then uh, the, next I have David Scribner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If you could just state your name and address, and we'll start a clock, and you have three minutes. Okay. My name is Shannon levy He. I live at 107 San Nicholas Circle, Fort Wayneany. Ready for me? Yes. Okay. In September 2019, Roy Heath, my husband, and I moved into our home. The transition between the sidewalk and our driveway approach had a temporary patch bordered by yellow caution paint. We were informed that the work had been done by the city to repair damage caused by tree roots from a tree planted and subsequently removed. At the time, we believed that a permanent repair would be completed by the city at a later date, one which would match the portion of the approach that had been replaced earlier. On July 26, 2021, we received a courtesy notice from the Management Trust stating that the approach and adjoining sidewalk are our responsibility to repair. On August 6, Roy called City Hall seeking information regarding what is required to complete the repair. He was told to contact Steve Almkrantz. He called him that day and left a message, but received no response. On August 11, Roy went to City Hall and was given Charles Cable's phone number. He called and left a message. That afternoon, he received a call from Mr. Almkrantz, who informed Roy that he cannot make the repair himself, but must hire either a licensed contract, contractor with a Class A or C8 certification or a C-12 paving contractor. Furthermore, Mr. Almkrantz informed Roy that we cannot repair only the raised section, 
but that the entire approach needs to be removed and replaced to confirm, conform to the current ADA requirements. He pulled permits for four properties in Oxnard, which had been completed repairs to the same type of approach. He suggested that Roy knock on the homeowner's doors, ask them who did their repairs and whether they were satisfied with the work. Roy was not comfortable with that suggestion. Our question is this, shouldn't the permits for those homes contain the names of the contractors who pulled them? Roy has attempted multiple times to contact three local contractors. Only one responded. They texted him a quote of $6,800, which does not include asphalt patching if required. That would involve a separate contractor. We feel that the quote is not only unreasonable, but not feasible, particularly since we are being asked through our HOA for additional assessments to repair damage caused by the tree roots I previously mentioned. We are willing to complete the job that has apparently become our responsibility. However, given the narrow parameters stated by the city, we are requesting assistance from the city of Port Wainini to either locate a reasonably priced contractor with the qualifications required or to provide a reasonable alternative that is satisfactory to the city, our HOA and us, and which addresses liability issues for all entities. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Our next public comment will be David Scribner. How do I start it? Oh, there we go. Hi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm here today as a uh, representative of the uh, Surfside Village Homeowners Association. I'm the president of it. And we asked the Heats, who live in our neighborhood, to repair the sidewalk. Uh, there's a long history of this that I want to go through, and hopefully I can get through it in a minute or two. Um, we were planned unit development. The landscape uh, situation was set up between the city and the uh, original landscape designer, and it was completely flawed. They planted enormous amount of uh, trees with uh, invasive roots. This has cost us uh, it's breaking our budget to be blunt. Um, one of the trees destroyed the sidewalk, the curb, uh, or the part where the, uh, I guess, approach in front of uh, their home before they bought it. Um, the former owner um, contacted the city and asked this to be fixed multiple times. Uh, nobody came out for a year. Okay, finally they showed up, threw some asphalt on it, and called it quits and walked away. It's still a tripping hazard, and it's unsightly. Um, Later, they proposed an ordinance, which you guys signed off on, putting the responsibility for all this back onto the homeowner. I have to state that half of the Heath's driveway was fixed by the city in the past, as was half of the other uh, neighborhood, right, the other house right next to them. So we have a situation where this, this problem was identified, the city did nothing about it until you passed an ordinance saying it's their responsibility and now they're stuck with seven, eight thousand dollars in costs, which um, seem outrageous. Now the other problem is that um, there's not been a lot of cooperation, obviously, with uh, the public works or whoever runs that department. Um, they were asked to get contractors with very specialized um, credentials. These are companies who do massive projects, like like neighborhoods. Uh, city streets, and they're not interested in doing a, a, a driveway for somebody. So the bid they were able to get was an offhanded one where the guy wouldn't even write down or even look at it, just said, I'll charge you 6800 bucks, sight unseen to fix it. So there's two or three things I would like to recommend in 30 seconds. Um, so the first one is, uh, there's a simple solution to this, that the city will come out and grind down the sidewalk. It's about two inches lifted. There's several other spots in Surfside Village that have been ground down like this. Um, that would solve the problem or give Mr. Heath the ability to hire somebody to fix it for him. Uh, the city won't, at this point, won't touch it because it's deemed to be his property. <coughs> um, the second is 
the city really needs to come up with a list of contractors um, or some, some guidance to move forward. As you can see, he's a pretty competent guy and trying to go out and find the contractor with a specialized license in this environment is next to impossible. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have a, uh, George, I'm gonna hold your comment for the housing meeting. May I have a, the next item on our agenda is to approve the agenda. May I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda? Motion. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Appears to be unanimous. Now we're going to recess to special joint session of the Housing Authority and Surplus Property Authority meeting. Johnny's in position. I'd like to call to order the special joint session of the Port Wyoming Housing Authority and the Surplus Property Authority. Madam Clerk, can you take a roll call vote, please? Sure. Our first roll call vote will be for the Housing Authority. Member Brown? Here. Member Hernandez? Here. Member Martinez? Present. Member Perez? Here. Vice Chair Rollins? Here. And Mayor uh, Chair Gama? Here. And the second roll call vote will be for our Surplus Property Authority. Member Hernandez? Yes, here. Member Martinez? Present. Member Perez? Here. Vice Chair Rollins? Here. And Chair Gama? Here. Now, I do believe we have a public comment. George? If you could please just state your name and address for the record. Thank you. George Shop, 157 East Scott Street, Apartment 411. And um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Pro Tem, uh, members of the staff, thank you for allowing me a moment to speak. Um, first of all, we... Uh, just got our bus stop clear. <laughs> uh, we've been uh, trying to get the bus stop cleaned up from an overgrowth of ivy and a tree, and uh, it finally happened today. Uh, so I don't know whether it was uh, uh, possibly Jessica or uh, uh, Mr. Connors or uh, uh, Mr. Gama who helped us do it, but thank you uh, for finally getting that done. And uh, we've also cleared up uh, the problem with the weeds in the vacant lot uh, uh, along the street where a lot of people have to park get out of their cars with a two foot tall weeds full of bees. Uh, there, that's finally been taken care of as well. So uh, thank you for that too. Um, and now that we're all finally able to meet in person, uh, some uh, long, long past uh, remarks. Um, I want to thank uh, many of you uh, for helping us through the coronavirus last winter. Uh, a lot of people helped out in a lot of ways. Mr. Connors, you helped. Uh, uh, Mr. Gama, you helped a lot. Uh, Jessica and Gabby helped a great deal. Uh, Chief Salinas and uh, his staff and the Explorer Scouts uh, helped a great deal. And we want to thank you all for uh, for helping it. We appreciate it very much. Uh, we made a remarkable trip through that whole thing with very little effect on our VISTA. Uh, it was surprising. We had, we sadly, we had two people that we lost. Uh, but uh, other than that, a senior building like that could have turned into a, uh, a mass, you know, uh, uh, event there. But uh, with the thanks of everyone here and all your help, we made it through. Um, and so hopefully we're going to make it through, you know, this next winter when uh, we may have another spike. They don't know. But uh, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, George. Um, now, I have another card for you. Is 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 that for um, the Housing Authority, or, or did you? I was going to do a presentation on the, the resident council. It's for item number four, to sir. Follow it up with okay. Okay. So, all right. I'll all hold right? it till then, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have a consent calendar. Minutes of the Housing Authority and Surplus Property Authority special meeting of May 17, 2021, and the minutes for the June 21, 2021, and the minutes for the August 9th, 2021, and the minutes for August 16th, 2021. The recommendation is to approve the Housing Authority and Surplus Property Authority special meeting minutes. May I have a motion, please? I move approval. Thank you. Can I have a second? Second. Shall we do a roll call vote, Madam Clerk? Yes, sir. 
Uh, Member Hernandez? Yes. Vice Chair Rollins? Yes. Member Brown? Yes. Member Martinez? Yes. Member Perez? Yes. And Chair Gama? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Moving right along. We're going to adjourn. It's the surplus property. Okay, so um, we're going to adjourn the Fort Wainimi Surplus Property Authority at this moment. And now we're going to have a presentation for the Housing Authority by the director, Gabby Basua. up on the microphone okay Thank you. I can do that Thank can you. Go. shall we time you just kidding <laughs> yes please I'll take a minute Okay, I hope I'm going to speak as loud as I can to do this mask. Um, good evening, Chair, members of the board, city staff. Um, I'm here today to give you an update on the windows and doors um, at Mar Vista Senior Apartments. Um, it's going to be a very short presentation. I just wanted to give you some information um, so that you may have this information. We've had some challenges at Mar Vista trying to get contractors to um, walk the building as far as replacing the windows and doors there that you had approved earlier last year. Um, we have had a bed bug infestation since March 17th. That's the first time that we realized that we had an issue at Mar Vista. Um, what we did at that point was we called out Western Exterminator, who is our extermination company, and they did um, some fumigation through some of the units. That fumigation was not successful. Um, I was not happy with their recommendation as far as the way they wanted to treat the building. Um, just a little bit of back history for you. About five, seven years ago, we had the same issue at Mar Vista. And what we did at that point was we brought in canine dogs and we went through every unit and we had a massive um, heat treatment that happened at the building. Um, and over time, we had contracts with the fumigation company to bring the canines back every quarter. And we, we did that um, religiously for about four years, and then we stopped. And now we're here back to 2021, where um, the lack of preventative maintenance, um, I'm going to blame on why we had so much infestation this time around. Um, a massive remediation took place um, this month on the 8th and the 9th, and um, it was a big undertaking. All the residents had to be out of their units anywhere from four to eight hours. Um, my staff was there on site to provide assistance. We provided breakfast and lunch to the residents of Mar Vista, but that in itself has really put a hold on getting these windows and doors the contractors into the building um, to do their job site walkthrough. So we've had to really, really stop on everything that has to do with Mar Vista. As you know, these bed bugs are extremely contagious. They go from unit to unit. Um, and we did not wanna make the situation even worse, but we also, the vendors won't go in the building also because they wanna take their own precautions. Um, so here we are, it's fall. We're gonna get close to winter and we are on a stall with this. So what is gonna happen in the interim? In the interim, starting next week, my staff will take the next three weeks and start preventative maintenance again. Um, what does that mean? That means we're gonna go into every single unit. We're going to check the windows. We're gonna check the doors. We're going to make sure that they're tight, they're sealed and they're ready for this winter. With that being said, this is what we tentatively have on the calendar. An RFP has been released. We have a scheduled October 6th 
job site walkthrough through the building. On October 13th is the deadline for um, RFPs to come back to the city and I hope to award or hope you will award the contract on October 18th. But as you know, that's already late fall. We're gonna be going into the winter in December. I don't know what that schedule is going to look like. <clears throat> Weather permitting, I'm going to push that we continue this project and we move it forward. Um, that is all the information I have for you right now. And I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions? I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Basu. Oh, did, did you want to go? Yeah, go it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, for your presentation. And that's really unfortunate to hear about the um, bed bug infestation. I know those can be very, quite persistent. So what's the status of the um, bed bug infestation now? And what did you do to remedy the situation? So what we did to remedy the situation is we had the canine dogs out at Mar Vista again about a month ago. And we went ahead and pinpointed which units had active bed bugs. We went ahead and heat treated those units. If we did not have an infestation in it, every other unit got um, treated just with chemical. So we hit every single 60 units um, at the building was treated for bed bugs. Now I do have to let you know that just today before I came here, we did have a call from a resident at Mar Vista stating that she still had the bed bugs. These bed bugs are extremely persistent. Um, when the tenants are preparing for the heat treatment, a lot of them like to take their stuff with them. We don't recommend that because the bed bugs travel with them. So if they went ahead and brought their stuff back after the heat treatment, then we've, again, we've mm -hmm. got an issue. The good part is, is that now we're back to a preventative maintenance contract with the um, extermination company. So we'll be able to hopefully get this under control. Using the canines? Yes. Good. Thank you. Johnny. Okay. My question is, uh, uh, good evening, Mayor, uh, Mayor and council members and uh, city staff. Uh, my question is, uh, you know, I, I first brought up about the windows and I, my question, my what I tried to get done then was weather stripping and caulking and sealing the windows. But the answer I got back was they couldn't do it because it was gonna affect the that air quality or something in the room. So they didn't do it. So at that time, uh, Mayor Berg, he said, well, we can't fix them, just replace them. So, he made a motion, it was seconded, voted on, and passed to put the windows in. And I've been asking every year, two or three times a year, what's going on with the windows, what's happening with the windows. Okay, they did come in one time and try to put weather stripping in. It didn't happen, not in my case, uh, and others either. You know, so I see that you're gonna do preventive maintenance to the windows and is that supposed to stop all the cold air coming in? And because the glass is thin and it gets very, very cold in there. And it's, it's bad, especially for the other, other uh, uh, residents that live there. And so is this supposed to stop the cold air from coming in? The, you're going to go in there and, and uh, what this trip or what are you going to do? Yeah, so they're going to go back in there, check the windows. A lot of times the windows are off track. If we need to weather strip, we will weather strip. Um, I cannot guarantee you that it's going to be 100%. Um, and you are correct. When um, Mayor Berg at the time said, let's replace these windows, that was the intent. But if you also recall, the money wasn't there through HUD yet. So we had to wait an additional year for the cycle to happen in order for us to get the capital grant fund that we need in order to get this done. Um, if you recall, we had said it was going to cost us, you know, we, we had an amount and I can't recall the amount, but it was insufficient when we went out and did um, what we call an ICE um, as far as trying to see how much this was going to cost. So it did push us back in order for us to get that capital grant money in. Well, you know, it, it's going on five years now. I have the minutes of the meetings where I brought it up, where they, where they passed it and they said they were going to put them in. 
you know, and it's probably five years, and it was supposed to be done within the first uh, five year uh, uh, plan. And uh, while well, every year something comes up where they don't have the money, something happens, that will do this or that. So every year something happens where we don't get them, and they just keep getting pushed off and pushed off. And now it's already five years, but I know that you changed it from continue 2021 to 2122, which to me, Matt, man, you're going to give you time to next June. We, we are hoping to be able to execute at least the contract this year, Member Brown, and to start on the process as soon as possible. Yeah. I'm not worried about, so much about myself. I believe that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do it for everyone. No, I, and, I, and I definitely needs understand them. that. I, I'm not talking about just me. I'm talking about everybody needs them. It gets cold. The air, the wind comes right through. You know, on, on a, on a wind, cold, windy day, you can see the blinds moving, the air, the wind's coming right through, dust comes in. I mean, you know, I, I just was hoping that we'd get them put in by now, you know, and uh, I'm glad that you're speaking about them and you're going to start at least trying to weather strip them, but I, I, was, I, I was hoping to hear you say we're going to start putting the windows in now, hmm. but uh, I guess that's not going to happen yet. And, Ho hopefully uh, you will hear those words pretty soon. I'm sorry? You will hear those, those words pretty soon. I didn't understand you. <laughs> so I hope to tell you that we're going to be installing the windows and doors pretty soon. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, well, thank you for listening to me. And uh, I just wanted to bring that up because I, I, I do have the minutes of the meetings where it was passed and they were supposed to put them in. It's, in this, uh, five years. I have the copies. Right, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Director Basua? I, I did. Um, so it seems like the uh, the dogs are a pretty effective way to detect bed bugs and eliminate them. What now? And they used to do it all the time. Why did they cut it out four years ago? Was it not budgeted for, or, or, when, when or why took, wasn't it budgeted so for? So when we took really big budget cuts, that's one of the things that went at that time. It was the preventative maintenance for the dogs, and it's I'm literally been about two years. Anything. Yeah, so it, it's back <laughs> on the radar now, and it's back in the budget. You know, um, other things will have to, you know, be cut in order to accommodate this. But it's obviously a lesson learned. Um, the amount of money that was spent this time around um, was it, is a lot. Okay. Council Member Martinez. Uh, no, I have one more. Yes, thank you, Mayor Gama, and thank you, Ms. Basua, for your presentation. Um, me being an optimistic person, what would be the best case scenario in terms of getting the, the windows installed, the windows in the doors? November. November. Weather permitting. Okay. Okay, we'll go back to Mayor Pro Tem Rollins. So, so the RFP is to do winterizing. No, the RFP is for the inst the removal and the installation of new double pane energy efficient windows okay. and doors sliding doors so that so ideally that would those installation would be what in december or january or i'm not going to have a specific date until the rfp um come back and we award the contract um but i'm definitely going to be pushing for it weather permitting that we get this done quickly so so how much is uh, how much is the, this preventative weather stripping winterizing costing us that's not costing us much that's something that we're doing that in-house as a preventative maintenance um if you recall because of covid we have been very limited in the scope of work that we're sending our facility guys in there so starting next week they will be going back in there to check those windows and doors and do what they need to do in order to if they need to be um restripped cocked um, whatever it may be i know from my standpoint since it's been delayed five years i would like that we kind of have like regular reports of the status of this thing because it seems to have been drawn for a long period of time for whatever reason and i feel bad for the citizens who've had to deal with this for five years okay well noted thank you council member press council member hernandez okay so i just have one comment um 
I think all of us do remember that meeting. It was very cold that night. And um, that was three years ago. And so um, I would just like to strongly encourage you to make this a high priority and let's try to get it done before it gets really cold. And um, perhaps you could give us regular updates and um, maybe the resident council could help with identifying the units that are in most need of weather stripping at this time or the clients who are most vulnerable to illness. So anyways, I hope, uh, I really hope that uh, we could get this done before the first of the year. And um, I think everyone up here is probably in agreement that we should push for that. So thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. We're now going to move on to the consent calendar for the housing authority. The recommendation is to receive and file the finance cash disbursements for June 15th, 2021 through September 10th, 2021. The recommendation is to receive and file the disbursements. May I have a motion? I'll second it. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Member Hernandez? Yes. Chair Gauntlet? Yes. Member Brown? Yes. Member Martinez? Yes. Member Perez? Yes. And Vice Chair Rollins? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We're now moving on to business items for the Housing Authority. We'll have a report on the Resident Council from Gabby Basua. Director Basua, thank you. Thank you. Um, this report is um, going to be in regards to the Resident Council that you requested um, months ago. So what is a resident council and what is the role of a resident council? Um, the role of a resident council is to improve the quality of life um, for the residents and have them able to be able to participate in a self-help initiatives to enable residents to create a positive living environment for families living in public housing. Um, examples of these duties um, are organizing educational classes, assisting the PHA with its initiatives, notifying the PHA with issues at Mar Vista, sort of like the windows, what um, Mayor Gama just said, um, and tenant activities in order to create a great community environment. Who's eligible to be part of the resident council? Well, the resident council, anybody over the age of 18 that's on the lease can be part of the resident council. HUD does provide the agency with money for tenant participation activities. Um, and the PHAs make these funds available to the resident council. The, re the PHA and its resident council must work together and decide how the funds will be used for tenant participation and activities. So currently the resident council has $880 a year to spend on its activities. The election procedures and standards are something that we have to hire a third party to oversee. And also if there was to be a recall on any members of the resident council, that is also something that the housing authority would have to um, have an independent third party do. So um, a little bit about how the Mar Vista resident council came about. Um, in January, 2019, the PHA contracted, hired Nan McKay and Associates, who is one of the leading um, agencies for housing authorities as far as training and compliance. They went ahead and gave a two-day class at Mar Vista for the residents. So it was a full-on class environment, um, and we had great participation. I, I'm going to say maybe about 20 to 25 residents participated in these classes. An election was held on July 1st, 2019, where five residents um, were elected to the resident council. And I did name those residents there and the roles that they had. On August 14th, the five elected members, and this is 2019, so I'm talking about 2019, the five elected um, members submitted council bylaws. So the purpose of this was to go ahead and have the election, then have the people that were successful and were elected to serve on this board to come together and start working on their own bylaws. Um, on August 14, 2019, we did receive the first draft from this body and we denied 
the bylaws. They were not um, they were not concurrent with HUD regulations at the time. On September 10th, um, we received a second draft by the by um, the people that were elected, and again we denied that draft again. It was at that point where um, myself and Jessica Serta started working with the resident council um, an hour at a time so we can work on their bylaws um, and have them approved. This was a long process. It was months in the working. It was back and forth. It was the resident council letting us know why they wanted certain bylaws, and it was the housing authority telling them why maybe certain bylaws couldn't be part of the bylaws because some of them maybe violated a HUD regulation. So it was a long process. Um, on July 13, 2020, an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, was executed between um, the Housing Authority and the Resident Council, making their formation um, in the eyes of HUD final. Um, so the resident, so let me go back to this slide. From the Resident Council has had its challenges since its formation. From July 1st, 2020 to July of this year, the Resident Council has lost four of its elected original members. Um, on January 2021, the Resident Council that was in place elected Mr. Benjamin Castillo um, to the Resident Council in order to fill those vacancies. Due to COVID, the Resident Council activities have been limited to minimal to none activities. So the Resident Council, because of COVID, have been very, very limited in their activities that they're able to do with the community. In July of this year, we met with the two remaining board members, which was Mr. Castillo and Mr. Shoup. Um, at that time, based on the bylaws, we needed to hold elections. Because of COVID and because of because of the fact that they were not able to actually do much activities, um, we decided to allow Mr. Shoup and Mr. Castillo to appoint additional members to the resident council in order to have them be a full body. Um, the current board members are listed above, and I see a lot of, I see at least three, four of them here, maybe three, um, in the audience. Um, and that is going to conclude my presentation in regards to the resident council. Um, I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions for Director Basua? Madam Pro Chair Morales, go ahead. With the process, like since HUD has all these regulations as to what the bylaws should be, and most of the people who are on this board are probably novices of even developing bylaws. Why weren't they just kind of presented with, this is kind of how you can operate? Yes, so the Nan McKay training kind of gave them an overview of what the bylaws should be. But they're allowed, just like any other governing agency, to add additional things to their bylaws. So for example, they're able to add, instead of, I want, the elected officials that win to be on a four-year term instead of a two-year term. They, they've got to set up those rules for their organization. They can set up the rules as far as how often they're going to meet. Um, so um, they're allowed to do all those things. Um, so that's why. So uh, with the current rules, how often are they meeting? Or, or the new group, How will, are they going to be meeting monthly, quarterly, annually? So the group does, they are an independent group, um, not ran anything with the housing authority. The only thing the housing authority does is we try to be an advocate um, for them and we provide them with the money that they need as long as we approve the expenses. Other than that, I believe George is here. George, you meet once a month? Yes, sir. So they've been limited to once a month with no meetings because of the mask. Well, we okay. And so now there are 
approved bylaws that they can move on from there? Yes, the bylaws have been approved um, since July 2020. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Having seen none, I, I would just make a comment. Congratulations. I think um, getting more people involved in the management of your residence is great, and I believe it gives um, Director Basu a whole new set of eyes out there looking for things that, that could be corrected before they become a, a problem. And, and um, at this time, uh, I believe, George, you have a public comment that you would like to make? Okay. My name is George again, that I haven't moved since last time. Uh, <laughs> is your name still George? Yeah. <laughs> um, once again, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Pro Tem, um, Mr. Connors, uh, uh, members of the staff. <clears throat> It was a long, tedious process to organize the resident council and uh, get it recognized from the housing authority, but we did finally do it. Uh, I want to thank you, especially Mr. Connors, for uh, helping us finally get the bylaws put together and finalized. Uh, we did not do that bad a job <laughs> on the first draft, but we uh, worked out and made some changes. Uh, it's been less growing uh, since then due to the restrictions of the coronavirus. Uh, however, we've worked hard to do the best service of our, to our community that we could and to get through the shutdown and the isolation that we all went through. Uh, service to our own Mar Vista community is our prime objective of the Resident Council. Uh, we're looking forward to expanding, working with uh, more activities and service to the residents uh, in the near future as soon as we can rid of some masks. And uh, we want to thank Gabby and Jessica for their cooperation and uh, willingness to work with us. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, an interesting and much more productive future soon. So anyway, thank you uh, to all of you and uh, to Gabby Jessica. Thank you very much. Okay, we are now going to move on. Do you need a motion to receive a call? Yes, we do need a motion to receive and file. Second. Thank you. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Member Hernandez? Yes. Member Martinez? Yes. Member Brown? Yes. Member Perez? Yes. Vice Chair Rollins? Yes. And Chair Gama? Yes. Motion Thank passes. you. Okay, we're now at the point in time where authority members report comments and requests for future agenda items. At this time, members of the Housing Authority may make comments and or provide reports. Mr. Brown, would you like to go first? I have nothing to say at this time. Thank you. No comments. Member Perez? Member Martinez? Any any comments? Right? Yes. Um, related yeah, related. I, I was notified by some of the residents that there's, um, I guess, someone there's like water being you know it's leaking off one of the balconies onto someone else's balcony just wanted to make sure if they can check up on it okay thank you staff will take a note of that and work with the with the resident council on that <laughs> Mer uh, member rollins yeah the only thing is i want to reiterate that i'd like to have kind of regular updates on this window situation thank you um so my comment is, is I am stumbling a little bit up here. I'm, I've had a bout of uh, allergies and I took a half a Benadryl and it's kind of tough trying to keep focus. And then my glasses keep fogging up. So I apologize for the mistakes I've made. Um, I do want to congratulate uh, the resident council and I want to encourage you to, to stay highly involved and I want you to, to help make Director Basua's life much more tolerable and, and manageable um, because having an engaged resident council with, with your set of eyes out there is very helpful to maintaining a, a safe and livable environment. So um, congratulations on getting through all these obstacles. Congratulations on getting through COVID. We're almost there, at least I hope we're there. And uh, anything that any of us can do to help and, and promote uh, safety and, and the, the well-being of your residents, give us a call. So thank you. Thank you very much. 
<laughs> Thank you, Nusi. Thank you very much. Okay, are there any other comments or questions? Mm -hmm. We are now going to adjourn the Port Wainimi Housing Authority. Port Wainimi Housing Authority will adjourn to the next regular meeting of October 4th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. As Director or Member Brown exits the dais, we will reconvene the City Council regular meeting. Tonight, uh, we have three presentations. The presentation number five has been canceled due to uncontrollable circumstances of, of us. And so we're gonna move on to Mayor Six. Council Member Perez is going to provide the Suicide Prevention Month proclamation. Proclamation for Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. Whereas September is known as National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month and is intended to raise awareness on this stigmatized and often taboo topic, in addition to shifting public perception. And whereas suicidal thoughts, much like mental health conditions, can affect anyone regardless of age, gender, race, orientation, income level, religion, or background. And whereas importance should be placed on ensuring that individuals, friends, and families have access to the resources they need to discuss suicide prevention and to seek help. And whereas we encourage people to bring their voices together to advocate for better mental health care and encourage any person experiencing suicidal thoughts or behaviors to seek help. And whereas the development of a crisis response system is critical for those at risk to have a number to call, a system to turn to that would connect them to the treatment and support they need. And whereas while suicide prevention is important to address year round, Suicide Prevention Awareness Month provides a dedicated time to come together with collective passion and strength around a difficult topic. And whereas suicide is the second leading cause of death among people aged 10 to 34 and the 10th leading cause of death overall in the United States, the overall suicide rate has increased by 35 percent since 1999. And whereas 46 percent of people who die by suicide had a diagnosed mental health condition, and while nearly half of individuals who die by suicide have a diagnosed mental health condition, research shows that 90% experience symptoms. And whereas we use this month to spread hope and vital information to people affected by suicide and encourage others to research, educate, and stand ready to recognize and assist those who need help. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the City Council of Port Wainimi hereby recognizes Suicide Prevention Awareness Month and encourages the community to spread awareness with, for this important cause. Thank you very much for that. Um, I would just like to add that um, all of us could help with the prevention of teenage suicide particularly, and um, there are some very obvious warning signs that are easily recognizable if you're paying attention. So if you're involved with the youth of our community, when you see a drastic change in behavior or sudden use of drugs or alcohol or turning off to your friends and family, that's a very good sign that there's something mentally going on. And so we just want to make sure everybody is aware and what to look for. And, and if you're engaged with youth, help protect them and guide them. I would like to also add that although Mayor Gama is correct, um, sudden change in behavior does indicate an issue. There are times where you don't know that there is a problem and you can go years without recognizing the symptoms before you realize that it's too late. So I would suggest as a mother who is a suicide loss survivor to talk to your children and make sure that even if they tell you no, that everything's fine, that you insist on um, pro providing help and making sure that they are talking to you on a regular basis. Thank you very much for that. Um, any other comments or questions? We're going to move on to COVID-19 update. Scott Matalon, our emergency preparedness manager, will make the presentation. Well, good evening. 
Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council and staff. I think if we look around the room, I don't know anybody in here who would uh, have suspected that COVID-19 would be now going on to 18, 19, 20 months and beyond. Uh, as we look back, uh, Chief Salinas has been providing us uh, very regular updates on COVID-19. And as we move into our long-term plan, uh, as your emergency preparedness manager, it is now my job to uh, continue briefing you periodically uh, throughout the remainder of the emergency as to the status of COVID-19 in our city of Fort Wayne. Now, uh, I wanna talk about uh, one quick thing here. Um, as we move into the presentation, there's going to be some hot topics we're gonna talk about tonight. And I respectively ask, uh, please hold your comments or questions to the very end. Um, there's a couple of slides that I may get to that will answer those questions as we kind of go in order. Uh, and then at the end, uh, please feel free to uh, ask me any questions about COVID that uh, have come up through the presentation. And here are those topics. Uh, we're going to talk about a number comparison, as we always do, uh, for infection rates. Uh, we're going to talk about vaccine uh, updates, mask mandates, uh, proof of vaccinations, vaccine mandates, vaccine boosters, upcoming clinics that we're going to have here in the city. And uh, <laughs> finally, a new topic for the COVID presentation is uh, employment and or unemployment here in Ventura County. So without further ado, let's move to the first slide. So here we have a comparison from where we were in last meeting in June to September. And as you can see, uh, there's been a, what I would consider a significant increase in testing. We went from 1.5 to 1.8 million tests completed. Uh, and we've noticed on this second line, our positive case uh, back in June was hovering in the 81,000 range. We're now up to 93,000. So what we've seen is about 12,000 uh, increase in the number of cases we have currently uh, in, in September. Uh, one of the disclosures I'll make to you is, of course, the county updates their numbers uh, regularly on Monday uh, afternoon and or evening. So there's a couple of numbers that have changed just slightly as expected on a Monday morning or excuse me, on a Monday evening. Uh, so I'll mention a couple of those as uh, we move on. Um, our deaths, we had a 1,022 back in June. And unfortunately, we've added 93 uh, to that total as we move into the later parts of September. Uh, our ICU, I wanted to just point out quickly that um, the county measurement tool has slightly, uh, I'll say, improved on that, where they now break down uh, patients into how many total, uh, how many on ICU, which is 31, staffed beds at 169, and ventilators at 137. So let's talk locally here in Port Wayne. We had 2448 back in June. We have 2776 currently today, and that's an increase of 328. Uh, unfortunately, we have add, added one more death here in Wyoming, and our active case rate as of today, uh, we have 45 in the city. Uh, that's an increase of 40. As you can see on here, uh, we can tell our positivity rate at 4.5. Uh, there's a few numbers on here that at first glance looks like, okay, uh, we have a 19.8 case rate, a seven day average per 100,000. But by showing this, I wanted to put into perspective a little bit on where we were in comparison back in March. And if you remember correctly, uh, we used to have the, the tiers. We had you know, purple and red and orange and yellow. And if you look at our seven day average, and I have that purple arrow pointing to it, we went from 9.1 per 100,000 to 19.8 currently. Um, so that is double plus some. Uh, some of the good news that came out from our numbers that got released uh, prior to this meeting just a couple hours ago, um, that 19.8 has dropped on a, a good side to about 16. So what we are seeing is an average downward trend as of the last week, last 14 days. So that's good news. Uh, I'll direct you to two other categories, the seven-day PCR testing positivity rate uh, back in March. It was 3.5, and today it's uh, 4.5. Uh, one other bit of good news that has dropped uh, down into the three and a half percent range uh, this evening. And last, and this is what you would expect to see, a 6.8 positivity uh, rating over seven day PCR back in March and currently we're at 
which is lower, and we expect that because as more people become vaccinated and experience some of those same symptoms as COVID and get tested, we would expect that result to, to go lower. So that's quite on track. So this is our vaccine comparison to where we were our last council meeting to where we are today and uh, a significant increase. We love seeing that. Uh, we're at 54.7 and now currently uh, at about 71. That has also increased slightly uh, for the numbers that came out uh, <coughs> earlier today. So Ventura County is doing uh, significantly better than some of the other counties around us and we're thankful for that. But we still want to encourage people if they haven't had the opportunity to get vaccinated and are just waiting for that right time, now is no better time out there. So please continue to uh, get vaccinated. So now we're gonna get into that mask mandate. So as you can see on the screen here in front of you, uh, Dr. Levin has extended the order. Uh, this is as of uh, September 17th, and we can all expect to be wearing our masks indoors pretty regularly, at least through uh, October 19th. Um, and then at that time, there will be another assessment, and I will bring that to you if the mask mandate continues. Okay, let's talk about proof of vaccination. We're getting part of that hot spot topics, right? And there's a very specific reason I listed Los Angeles County on here, but first let's talk a little bit about it. So as you may have heard on the news and in recent articles these days, um, bars, wineries, breweries, and nightclubs, lounges are all um, under a um, order to have their patrons provide uh, proof of vaccination. And uh, outdoor events of more than 10,000 people, so likely most of our sporting events and what have you, uh, are all requiring that you need to verify a vaccination or recidive uh, a recent negative COVID-19 test uh, as we move forward. So why did I bring Los Angeles County up when we're in Ventura? I think we all uh, can understand the idea that uh, Ventura County tends to look at LA County to see what they're doing. Um, I am not suggesting that we're moving to that today or tomorrow. The idea is, is that in the ability to prepare you for future, it just means that that is the trend that LA is going to. I'll refer you back to our vaccination rates. We're looking very good as a county. So uh, I'm not suggesting that we are going to dip there today or tomorrow, but just to be aware that um, our counties just to the south of us are moving in that direction. And again, vaccine mandates. So here's another one. Um, as you may or may not know, the city of Los Angeles moved uh, to mandate vaccines for their uh, city workers. Um, on this screen, I thought it would be uh, vital for us to take a look at uh, labor union representatives and some comments that they made for Los Angeles County. Again, just because Ventura tends to um, refer to Los Angeles uh, in some of these areas. And basically the point of this slide is to highlight that uh, the local SEIU issued a statement that basically says that they strongly encourage all uh, Los Angeles city workers to be vaccinated against COVID-19 and that they're working uh, in a capacity with the city departments to offer free mobile vaccination clinics throughout <coughs> the city. And to continue on, uh, they also had stated that they um, also would advocate for the city to have a robust and frequent testing option for all of the workers who haven't had the opportunity to get vaccinated. So again, uh, just in the emergency preparedness world, uh, we wanna be aware of it. Um, I don't have any current information that leads me to believe that the county and or our city is going to be there soon, uh, but it's just to make you aware that that is what they are doing in LA County at this time. So let's talk about the vaccine booster. This has been making uh, kind of some big news in the, in the world of Pfizer and Moderna. And as we know, the CDC issued um, some guidance uh, early on in the summer that basically called for people. They never really defined what people is. They just said people will be eligible for a third booster shot uh, starting eight months after they received their second dose. Uh, as of three days ago, I believe the US or the FDA came out and put their recommendation together that um, no, not just people are gonna get it, but those people have been identified and classified as 65 and older. 
and those with uh, 65 and older and underlying health conditions will be eligible for a booster. But they are holding currently right now for any other uh, category. So if you do hear of, of boosters happening, um, 65 and older uh, is what it's looking like. And speaking of uh, vaccinations, we do have a uh, COVID and flu uh, vaccine clinic popping up here in October 7th. It's gonna be from one to six over at the community center. So if you uh, do have any uh, folks that you know that are just waiting for the right time, this could be one of them. Uh, and again, they will have uh, the options for a COVID vaccine and also for that flu vaccine. And we thank public health for uh, being instrumental in setting that up for, for folks in our city. And finally, let's talk uh, on a new topic, uh, unemployment rates. So this one um, I specifically put in here for our Fort Wayne businesses and to kind of see how um, labor is looking and employment. And as you can see, we had a relatively low unemployment rate starting in the uh, fourth quarter of 2019 jumped up really high when we got into the midst of COVID, uh, hovered well over 13%. And as you can see from the graph, we're now on a kind of a downward trend, which is exactly what we wanna see. Some interesting points of uh, mention right now is we're, we're hovering around 6%, 6.3, somewhere in there. Uh, and we have a couple significant uh, things happening, both from the federal and state level, and that is the uh, subsidies are ending and rental assistance is ending. Uh, so what we are looking carefully at is, is that workforce then going to join into this group and start lowering the unemployment rate as people are now getting back to work, especially um, in the days of Zoom and now mas masking inside and we're all still gathered here now. So uh, I would expect to see that uh, as workers come back in from uh, not being subsidized and looking for job opportunities, that these numbers uh, will continue a downward trend. And with that, comes questions. Thank you, are there any questions? Council Member Perez. Sorry, the 70% of vaccinated rate that you mentioned, is that for both shots? I know at one point in time, we had a high percentage of people who had only received the one and a long time where people didn't go in for their second shot. Yes, 70% uh, is our uh, two shot. They've received both full doses in Ventura County. Great, okay, and my second question is, how do the, our percentages compare to other counties? Um, if you compare us to LA County, we're looking fantastic. Uh, we are currently in the same uh, trend for cities our size and actually doing a little bit better. Um, there was a report that came out uh, earlier today that had uh, Ventura County as one of uh, the better responding cities uh, to date. So as a county, we're doing, we're doing well. Um, one thing to point out there is, uh, if you remember back to when uh, Chief Salinas would talk about our proportion of Fort Wayne residents to the county and how are we doing, we wanted to hover around that 3% mark. We're about 34 uh, as of today. Um, again, with the numbers coming out uh, just before council uh, met, that number is trending downwards again. So what we are seeing is some, some progress being made. And what's uh, ultimately going to help that is, is folks getting uh, vaccinated. So it's looking good for us here. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I do. Congress. Um, I Congress. noticed in the stats that you reported in the beginning of your presentation that there was no reference to the breakthrough cases. Are, is the county not tracking breakthrough cases? Sure. Actually, we do have uh, breakthrough cases. Um, I can comment on them uh, as we are. Um, there have been, uh, in the 14 day uh, time period, uh, there were 303. Um, cases in our county that were breakthrough cases. Uh, there were 1,300, or excuse me, 1,318 cases from non-vaccinated individuals and 303 coming from vaccinated. If you do the math on that, that trends about 18% in the last 14 days are coming from vaccinated versus unvaccinated. I can also report to you um, on the county's website. Um, there are uh, 22 uh, breakthrough cases where the individual passed away. Uh, and that's trending at 2% over the overall uh, rate. Do you know the average age? I do not. 
Any other questions? Yeah, I just, um, I, I, I think the breakthrough cases are just the reason we're sitting here wearing masks. Um, I don't, I, some of you may know that I, I uh, acquired the virus um, earlier this month and I was vaccinated in March and uh, I uh, contracted the, the Delta variant and I believe I got it in an outdoor event uh, when I was, I don't think I had my mask on at the time. Um, so uh, I understand that we, even though we're vaccinated, we can still care, carry the Delta, the, well, the virus in our nostrils, right? Absolutely true. And so that's why we have to be really careful how we wear our masks and making sure that they're covering our nose. Because I've sat here now for a second meeting and I see people like mask teetering on their nose and some of it falls behind uh, underneath. So it's just wanted to make sure that our community understands that the, the threat is still very real, that we, we still need to be um, extra careful and wear our masks properly. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the interest, the other interesting thing I noticed is when I, um, when I tested positive for COVID, um, I, I did so with a store-bought test. And I wondered how those positive results get reported to the county, if at all. And how many people are out there in testing themselves from a store-bought test, sure. but how the results never reaching the county stats. Yes, and, and uh, I don't have an answer for how individuals who take those are. Uh, what individuals typically do is if you test positive for COVID with the ones that you get from the store, that tends to be a follow-up from the PCR. Um, although it is true that if you're test positive, it's very likely that you're gonna test positive for the, for the uh, virus with the PCR. But I imagine there's got to be some uh, contingent of people who have tested in both arenas and it gets reported. Um, but it's specifically if they don't do that test, then, then they would not. Um, I had an, a couple of more uh, things I wanted to say is, what are we doing to inform our businesses and our community of the extended mask mandate? I went to an event here in town on Saturday night and there was no posting of a mask requirement. Um, even though it was a business and it was indoors, and a lot of people weren't wearing their masks. Um, what are we doing to make sure businesses are clear on the requirements? Sure. Well, the first thing we'd like to do is encourage them to always check on fortwinningemergency.org, as that's our primary source for information uh, in the city. Um, and not only do we do that, uh, we do uh, social media reach out for folks. And I know there's businesses in the county that may not have that or look at other platforms. The other thing we need to do is also recognize that um, us as patrons going in can also have an effect on that. <coughs> that helps spreading the word just amongst the places that we frequent the most is a great way to do it. Uh, and then kind of go from there. Okay. Thank you. And um, I understand that the governor's um, extension for uh, virtual meetings uh, has been made up until October 4th. And I guess this is a, more of a question for a city manager. Do we have a plan or a trigger at which point we might go back to virtual meetings? I'll field that one for the moment. Uh, as of yesterday, I believe the governor signed AB 361, which allows for during states of proclaimed emergencies, it allows criteria for local agencies to have Zoom or remote meetings. Um, there are some changes that go on it. It's a little bit it's a little bit unclear how it works with respect to the Brown Act and certain other provisions, considering that AB 339 was also not passed. So it, those two acted in concert to modify the same Brown Act section, and right now there's a lot of scrambling amongst city attorneys to figure out exactly what happened, because most of the research out there assumes AB 339 would pass, AB 361 would pass and that AB 339 would pass first because there are provisions in the statutes that tell you what happens if it follows that exact series of events. So now the question is, is what actually happens? And now we have to figure out, we have to see whether or not AB 339 will be passed, but now that it's subsequent, what changes that will have? Uh, off the top of my head, I believe it delays the effective date of certain Brown Act provisions but it shouldn't change things from the extension of the governor's executive order. 
Thank you. you and there, and there's just one oh, final sorry. comment I wanted to make. Sorry, I'm taking so much time. Um, I just read today that while the conclusion of the um, EDD benefits ended on September 3rd or 4th, that we have not seen um, people returning to work yet. Um, maybe there's just holding out and they're spending their last monies, but we haven't really seen proof that people aren't going back to work because of the subsidies. And that's, that's something we're gonna be looking at closely and see, okay. see where it goes. Great, thank you. That's all. Council so I just, I just wanna make a comment to our community members um, to think about our small businesses. There have been several times over the past week since there's been a mandate where I've seen patrons go into the businesses and it's primarily the small businesses that I'm concerned about without having a mask on. And I understand that small businesses aren't going to require you. They're not probably not going to say anything. But the problem that it could lead to is the health department is a stickler for the mandate. And they do have individuals in our community that do frequent our community unannounced um, and kind of undercover. And they will fine our businesses if they see patrons in there without masks on. And I would hate to see one of our local businesses be fine because an individual decided that they didn't agree with the mask mandate and entered the premises without one. So I would like our community members to have a little more respect for our small businesses and just put a mask on or don't go into the business. Thank you. Council Member Martinez. Mayor Pro Tem Rollins. And I, I'm always conflicted. Like I wear my mask going into a restaurant and I sit down and then I take it off for the rest of the time and then I put it back on. So like, you know, hopefully it's helping that it, for that short period of time when I first come in that, you know, I'm saving somebody <laughs> or being saved myself. <laughs> Good for you. Thank you. Um, so if a decision is going to be considered to go back to Zoom meetings um, in the construct of our disaster council, that would be the body to make that decision. Is that correct? I would refer to city manager in conversation. Well, it's re relegated by a higher authority. Right. Executive order. Yes, right. Okay. So, so in the event that uh, we are considering um, making a change, then we would assemble the disaster council and have a meeting and then make a decision, unless being directed to by the county. That's correct. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Thank you for the presentation. We are now going to move on to the consent calendar agenda. Number eight, approve minutes of the city council for the regular meeting of September 7th, 2021. The recommendation is to approve the minutes. Number nine, uh, receive and file the finance cash disbursements from August 30th, 2021 through September 10, 2021. The recommendation is to receive and file the disbursements. Authorization to award a contract to J&H Engineering General Contractors Incorporated for the reconstruction of a portion of the retaining wall and replacement of a flagpole in Beach Parking Lot A. Number 11 is the Treasurer's Investment Report. Number 12, continuation of the Memorandum of Understanding with Wainimi Elementary School District for administration of the School Crossing Guard Program, an award of sole source contract to all city management services for crossing guard services. The recommendation is to continue the Memorandum of Understanding with the Wainimi Elementary School District for the administration of the School Crossing Guard Program for 21-22 and 22-23 school years, and award a source sole source contract per municipal code section 2564A to all city management services, otherwise known as ACMS, for crossing guard services for the 2021-22 school year. I would like to um, pull item 10 for a quick little, uh, uh, excuse me, um, yes, item 10. Um, can we have the discussion first or should we approve the balance of the consent calendar? We'll approve the balance of the consent calendar and then we'll pull that uh, for immediate discussion following your roll call vote for consent calendar. Okay, I'm going to make a motion to approve item 8, 9, 11, and 12. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mayor. We have a roll call vote, please. 
Mayor Gama? Yes. Councilmember Martinez? Yes. Councilmember Hernandez? Yes. Councilmember Perez? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Rollins? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. In regards to item 10, um, it was my understanding that two flagpoles were crashed, not one. So it says replacement of a flagpole. So I was wondering if we could get clarification on that. So there's only three flagpoles at the corner? I thought there was four. Okay. Three flags? Okay. All right, thank you. Learn something new every day. So I'd like to make a motion to approve item 10. Second. May we have a roll call vote, please? Mayor Gama? Yes. Councilmember Hernandez? Yes. Councilmember Martinez? Yes. Councilmember Perez? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Rollins? Yes. Okay, we're now moving on to business items. Number 13, ratification of a side letter to memorandum of agreement between the City of Port Wanimi and Service Employee International Union Local 721 regarding certi certification incentive pay. Mr. Peretz will be making a report. Are you ready, sir? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Good evening. For the record, Charles Perez, Deputy City Manager. Uh, so item 13 uh, pertains to certification incentive pay. In sum, this is extra pay for the attainment of job-related certifications that are not otherwise required by an employee's job specification. Uh, most specifically, uh, this pertains to job classifications in the Department of Public Works, uh, where the department has indicated that the attainment of additional job-related certifications would assist and aid in the completion of job tasks assigned to that department. The side letter that has been developed uh, in conjunction with the SEIU group allows for annual stipends between $500 and $1,500 and provides for a maximum cap to any one employee of $3,000 in a particular year. The side letter identifies which positions would be eligible for these stipends identifies 14 different certifications as well as the agencies that are authorized to issue the certifications. That's my brief summary and I'm available for any questions. Anybody have any comments or questions? None? Okay, I'm gonna make a motion to approve the ratification of the side letter memorandum of agreement between the City of Port Wanamie and the Service Employees International Union Local 721. <laughs> Second. Mayor Gama? Yes. Councilmember Martinez? Yes. Councilmember Hernandez? Yes. Councilmember Perez? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Rollins? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, don't move, Charles. We're moving on to item 14, ratification of side letter to memorandum of agreement between the City of Port Wanimi and the Service Employees International Union Local 721 regarding parking, meter, maintenance, and service pay. Mr. Peretz. Yes, so item 14 would serve as a second side letter to the existing agreement between the city and the SEIU Local 721. Uh, this side letter uh, proposes to allow for uh, special pay, 5% pay for individuals assigned to maintain and service the city's parking machines. And it also allows for 10% pay to any employee assigned to train employees in those tasks. Uh, both this and the prior item would be side letters to the existing agreement, which is set to expire June 30th, 2022. I'm available for any questions that the council may have. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Hearing none, I'd like to make a motion to approve item 14. Second. Thank you. May we have a roll call vote, please? Mayor Gama? Yes. Councilmember Martinez? Yes. Councilmember Hernandez? Yes. Councilmember Perez? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Rollins? Yes. Motion passes. All right, we are moving along. Now we're going to move on to city manager comments and reports. At this time, we'll hear comments and reports from our city manager, Rick Connors. Thank you, Mayor. Honorable City Council, I have a couple items I just wanted to share with everybody really quick. Not too long ago, our Public Works Department commissioned a traffic engineer to evaluate one of our most significant uh, traffic uh, intersections. 
mainly between pedestrians heading to the beach and trucks coming out of our port of Wainimi. As a result of that uh, effort, um, we improved in many different areas in terms of um, uh, awareness visually for uh, uh, pedestrians as well as trucks. We've got extended uh, bulbs around the intersections where uh, cross traffic for pedestrians are. We've got uh, stop bars at the intersections. And probably the most significant thing is the queuing and parking for trucks um, that are uh, leaving or entering the port. Um, we'll see that was not that long ago, but we expect uh, some significant safety improvements as that, a result of that effort. I want to make everybody aware that uh, uh, this Saturday, sometime during the day, you'll see a bunch of people on bicycles. We have the annual California Coastal Arthritis Bike Classic. Uh, this happens every year. Obviously, it didn't have happened during COVID, uh, but uh, you'll see a bunch of bikes coming through the city. Um, I'll skip that one. Um, and then there's two items on the next uh, agenda on the 4th of October that I want uh, folks to be aware of. The first one is the Community Benefit Fund. Uh, recently, this past week, the Joint City and uh, Port um, a committee met to review a variety of different projects that are eligible for $173,000 in uh, current funding. Uh, through that uh, meeting, um, several projects were identified, um, and council had the opportunity to vote on those projects here at the next council meeting. They spanned from sponsorships uh, to um, monuments to public art um, to some other smaller projects. And the last item I wanted to share that's going to be on the agenda, uh, two years in a work uh, making, uh, almost 20 years since it's last been updated, I believe, uh, the first opportunity in public hearing to look at our general plan and our housing element. So that will be published 10 days prior to the 4th, where people can have a look at it. And with that, conclude my report. Thank you. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, I have a question. Are we able to ask a question of any of the comments you made? Yeah, we can ask a question, but we can't get into full-scale discussion. My advice would be to treat it like a like a public comment in that we can ask clarifying questions and whatnot, but not devolve into a conversation with council direction. Okay. I just wanted to make a comment that I appreciate the work that's been done near um, Market and uh, Wainimi Road. And um, I think it was a really great um, action to move the crosswalk up so you could actually see down the street. However, the threshold there is severely damaged and uplifted probably four or five inches. So I'm wondering if why that wasn't or if it's been um, acknowledged and on the um, planning stage to fix it. And then the other question is, is there an answer as to why there's not a crosswalk there? Because it's um, very concerning when I see strollers and bicyclists and people that walk on that side of the street and cross that street without a crosswalk. And I wonder if uh, if that was looked into or if, or if that's something that we could look into in the future. Because I'm sure Mr. Rollins could attest to the fact that we've seen many strollers, many bicyclists, many kids cross at that non-crosswalk area so i acknowledge your questions and concerns and i'll i'll provide feedback to both okay thank you all right we are going to move on to council members reports and comments and council member hernandez would you like to go first oh sure yes um First of all, I'd like to uh, start off by um, saying on, on behalf of the uh, my co-captain, uh, Mayor Gama, and myself, I want to thank um, everybody who helped us put together the coastal cleanup this year. The Every year it's a little different. We didn't even have it last year, and um, there were some a few miscommunications um, in the process of asking for city resources, but everybody came through. Uh, there were some last minute requests and I just wanted to thank uh, Chief Salinas and Tony Stewart and Anna Hanley and our city manager, Britt Connors, and, um, and uh, let's see, oh, and Scott for helping with the website. Um, everybody contributed in some way and, just, and it really uh, led to a successful event. We had over 200 
uh, volunteers um, participate in the cleanup. We collected over 7,000 uh, 7, pounds of debris, and we haven't even finished counting all the data sheets. And we had the, a ver variety of different groups there from school districts to uh, local business from Camarillo, the Navy base, um, and then Wainimi uh, High School Junior ROTC was also present. And uh, we covered over three and a half miles of beach and um, made even a bigger dent in the trash that's out there. And I just want to say thank you to everybody uh, who participated. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the, oh, uh, let's see. Um, my committee, my committee reports uh, don't really have too much. Um, I understand SCAG committee assignments are expiring, so there'll be an opportunity for uh, new assignments to SCAG committees coming up. Um, I, I think we'll probably hear about that more in a few weeks. Um, let's see. VRSD, the Ventura Regional Sanitation District, we had a meeting um, last week, went very well. We're doing some right sizing um, because we're having to increase our fees and tighten our budget. So we're right sizing our, our expenditures and also streamlining services. And I think eventually we will see that we'll be out of the business of dealing with wastewater. We'll be just dealing with, with solid waste management. Um, only uh when the when the time comes um let's see anything else oh i was really pleased to see uh, to see today at the mandalay um, village shopping center officer uh, montelongo getting out of his car i first saw a homeless individual with a sign at the corner there by the gym where they like to stand and ask for for money i saw him first and then i saw officer montelongo getting out of his car with um, some resources, a sheet of uh, resources. And he went up to the individual and handed it to him and spoke to him. And I pulled over and got a picture of him doing that. And uh, and then I went to my business, went and took care of my business and came back to that same corner and Officer Montalongo was gone. But the homeless individual had the piece of paper, he had his phone and he was actually dialing and getting on his phone trying to make a connection. So that was so encouraging to see. So I just want to communicate to, to Chief Salinas, thank you for that assignment, making that happen. And congratulations to Officer Montalongo. It was really nice to see him doing good work out there. And let's see, is there anything else I have? Oh, that pretty much does it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Perez. Council Member Martinez. I just want to say that I'm excited that we're going to be going to the conference this week, and I'm excited to see all of you guys over there. Yeah, hopefully we can bring back some valuable knowledge for all of us. Thank you for that. Mayor Pro Tem Rollins. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on one of the committees that I'm involved in, and that's the Ventura County uh, Transportation Commission. Um, I would just implore the public to look at the city website uh, there's a survey out right now um, dealing with people who drive their car, take the bus, or whatever way they transport themselves within the uh, city, of, well, within Ventura County. And they're looking into the future uh, to figure out ways that they can uh, make traffic better, uh, be able to allow the citizens of Ventura County to be able to equi equitably get from uh, one location to the other. And um, so the citizens look at the um, city website. It's a uh, uh, questionnaire, but and people sometimes don't like to take questionnaires, but think of it in the future. That's kind of how we're going to be better able to transport ourselves, be it through work, through pleasure, or whatever. So, Thank you for that. Um, yes, we completed the California Coastal Cleanup this weekend, and this is unlike any other Saturday that we do our beach cleanup. In, in this event, um, we had a targeted um, effort. We had um, we we're in cooperation with Surfrider Foundation, Coastal Keepers, um, and another group that David Scrivener headed up down at Arnold Road. We also had um, 
Driscoll Farms show up on their own and they had an unofficial site. So if you take all those different groups that work together, I think the number is probably in excess of 400, close to 400. And that doesn't include the port of Wainimi. Which That's right. The port of Wainimi as well was at the other side of the beach. So um, we, we had plenty of coverage to cover Wainimi Beach, but we also had a targeted area down the beach. <laughs> And um, for the first time in five years, um, and this was just such a huge milestone, we were able to walk off the beach knowing that on the beach side of the lagoon, it is very clean. And some of the complaints were there's no trash. And that's exactly what we're, you know, we're gunning for. And so I think we've been able to demonstrate that um, doing a little bit every week is great. And then when we have this major event, we, we go to that focus area and we have a targeted we hit it from all sides, and um, we had dumpsters that our city provided, and we had volunteers from all over the county coming to the city of our city to help um, keep our watershed and our beach clean. Also, want to just uh, mention um, um, this company, MWS Wires Incorporated. They donated 50 buckets um, to us, and we sent 25 over to. So we split the 50 buckets into two groups, 25 each. We sent 25 to Coastal Keepers and 25 to to our effort. Our, our buckets do deteriorate after a couple of years, and we have to throw them away. So these were widely um, appreciated. And then Mayor Pro Tem Rollins came over and helped me decorate them with the Reach Wainimi Beach sticker. Um, <laughs> I uh, had a re I had the best beacon meeting I think I ever had in my career as a city council member this past uh, Friday, um, and um, we have a beacon drafting a letter off to Julia Brownlee's office, and we're um, very factually and and politely and and um, requesting that we get full funding to move. 2.4 million cubic yards of sand from the sand trap to Wainimi Beach. And that's significant because over the several years, 30 years, we've never really consistently hit that target to mimic Mother Nature. So um, we got all hands on board. We have a, a very nice letter that's factually based. And we also had support from the port of Wainimi. And what was most appreciated from the port of Wainimi, they asked that we need to also look at making up that deficit that has occurred over the last several decades. And that deficit is causing problems down coast at the um, at Point Magoo, in which we all are aware of. So um, I feel like we have uh, made progress and we're going to keep pushing hard and we're going to try and sustain Wainimi Beach into the future. And um, so this book was given to me, and if you haven't had a chance to read through this book, this is an absolutely fascinating book at the history of Port Wainimi as a city. There are so many little tidbits and things in here that you may not know, so I strongly encourage you to, uh, I'll pass this book around if you're interested, and there's, it's just amazing, all the trials and tribulations of our city of Port Wainimi. Um, and uh, there's little things that uh, you, you just I, you're unaware of. One of them was that, you know, um, when the, the the Bard family donated Silver Strand Beach and Hollywood Beach to the county, it was done so so that the um, harbor, Channel Islands Harbor, small boat harbor could be constructed so it could be, also be used to trap the sand so that we could bypass the sand around the port of Wainimi. And they they ran out of money. And the city of Port Wainimi um, offered to float a bond if the county would allow us to uh, annex that, that area and become a part of our city and give us the master lease to the harbor. And the county put it on, said no and put it, on the, on the, uh, put it out to vote and floated their own bond. So there was a lot of wheeling and dealing back there. And uh, there, there's so much interesting stuff. So I just encourage everyone to, to read this book. Um, and then lastly, um, I just want to um, recognize uh, it's been a tough week um, for all of us. Um, we lost um, prior Mayor Ellis Green and prior Mayor Doug Breeze. And then a person that I served with on VCOG, um, 
Ellie Larson also passed away. She's a city council member from the city of uh, Fillmore. So, um, you know, we all are grieving um, their loss, and we uh, we send our condolences to their families. And and um, with that, I'd like to move on to the next item. Any other comments from council members? Okay. We are on the last item of our agenda, which is future agenda items. I'd like to remind council members that all requested items will require a motion, a second, and a majority vote per adopted council policies to be placed on a future agenda. Does anybody have any requests for future agenda items? Council Member Perez. I would like to uh, request a tribute to Ellis Green for October 4th. Um, his family will be putting together some brief words and pictures and they would like to be in attendance for that if it's approved. Second, oh, can I say second? Yes. Second. Okay, can we have a roll call vote? Council Member Perez? Yes. Council Member Martinez? Yes. Council Member Hernandez? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Rollins? Yes. And Mayor Gama? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. And I would like to also note that um, for the community that set Saturday, October 2nd at 11 a.m. at the Oxnard Performing Arts will be his going home service. Thank you. Council Member Martinez, do you have any requests for future agenda items? Anyone else? Last chance? Okay. I'd like to take this time to adjourn this meeting. We'll adjourn this meeting in the name of Alice Green and Doug Breeze. The time now is 8.15, actually it's 8.17 p.m. The next meeting will be the regular meeting of Monday, October 4th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. This meeting is adjourned.